So the, the happiest thing would be if I could announce uh, under Speakman as the politician who's going to fix all of these troubles, but unfortunately he is not going to speak about uh, only the, he is not going to cheer us up socially either. So uh, Anders uh, Ivar Sven Wigmar, he is a Swedish politician and uh, he has been the member of the parliament for two cycles and he's stepping down uh, this year. But in addition to being a politician, he also has uh, many uh, scientific credentials. He is uh, the vice president of the Club of Rome and also the Tolberg Foundation. He is also a member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences and he is a counselor of the World Future Council. He is the author of several books on issues related to disaster prevention, sustainable development, HIV, and so on, with his latest book, The Needless Tragedies, Man and Disasters, uh, which was published in 2005. But he has been extremely active in Europe in alarming uh, the politi political uh, community and also the decision-making community that we have to act on several areas. I can attest because there is almost no key meeting that I go to and he's not uh, there too. And clearly that's uh, just probably the tip of the iceberg. So with this, uh, uh, Andres, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know really how to do this because we have eight minutes left and then this session is over. So um, somehow we have probably to compromise a little bit of time. <clears throat> now I have prepared a presentation that includes quite a lot of the science uh, and refers to the science that Stefan and Dennis uh, spoke about. So I will uh, of course skip that and try to modify what I'm saying so that we don't repeat ourselves. Uh, but let me start by saying that I don't think it's correct to only speak about climate change. I think we have to speak about a number of several parallel crises. And we could start with the financial crisis spilling over into the economy, the climate change problem, and then I would add the ecosystem crisis. The fact that we are using and overusing, using beyond capacity ecosystems all over the world, which you could then uh, interpret as future constraints when it comes to natural resources use. And then around the corner, we are likely to have <clears throat> what experts call the peak oil phenomenon, namely that we've taken up more of the easily extracted oil reserves, meaning that it will be more and more difficult in the future to meet demand. Well, some of you would then say, okay, that's fine, because uh, oil use produces CO2, so, so, so that's fine then. But the problem is that <clears throat> as our economies are organized now, and with little change in the near future, we are likely to extract more coal and turn it into liquid fuels, which is going to be producing even more CO2. So, so we have a number of parallel challenges that has to be seen in perspective. And just as CO2 concentrations have gone up, you have this other curve which shows that the pressure on ecosystems, whether we talk about freshwater resources, forests in the tropics, fish in the oceans, uh, <clears throat> land uh, and soil quality, etc. We, we have an equation that over time is impossible. And as Stefan and Dennis showed us, there is an intricate interplay also between the atmosphere, the climate system, and the planetary system. Oceans soak up, absorb some of our CO2. Vegetation soak up some of our CO2. And changes in the ecosystems will affect climate change and vice versa. So I would submit we have to look at this as a more systemic problem. And that's one of my critical uh, as, uh, comments when it comes to Copenhagen. I think the approach is too narrow. What we really need is an agreement on, global, on the global environment, on sustainability, not only on climate change. And here you have sort of the, the dilemmas facing us. Population still growing, you have the overuse of ecosystems, and you have the climate change problem, and then down there, the surprise element, that was what Dennis and, and Stefan told us about, the tipping points out there that these systems are not linear, like in economic models. 
And this is important for economists to understand, because they have not understood it so far, with a few exceptions. I'm trained as an economist. I know what, what kind of education we get. You seem to think, most of you, that, that things change along a linear model, and, and they don't. You have tipping points out there that are unpredictable, and we don't know what's going to happen. Um, so IPCC provides good basis. Uh, the problems are more serious than the fourth assessment report told us. Here we have the tipping points. I skipped that. It would have been better to have something here. Um, maybe one minute on the adverse effects, because they are very serious, even if we stop emissions today, which, of course, is not possible. Like both Dennis and Stefan said, more extreme weather events. I spent 10 years of my life in the Red Cross, so I know a little bit about droughts, floods, heavy storms, etc. And these events are likely to be more frequent and, of course, hit more people and hit more poor people because the poorest of the poor, they live in areas which are very vulnerable, which are susceptible to those kind of extreme events. Shanty towns. A few years ago, there was more than 1,000 millimeter of rain in Bombay during 24 hours. The sewage system was designed to manage one fourth of that. You know, in, in the tropics, you have these torrential rainfalls. But most of the sewage system were overbuilt by shanty towns. So they brought, they could take out less of the water than one fourth, which meant that thousands of people drowned and the property damages were just enormous. And you have so many shanty towns in low-lying areas, in river deltas, that are very, very vulnerable, susceptible to this. Visit Bangladesh and you'll see. So some of those critics who say that there is no problem, if they visit these locations, they will probably start realizing there is a problem. Water scarcity, many regions will suffer. Southern Europe is one example. When I entered the European Parliament in 1999, most of my colleagues from Portugal, Spain, Italy, they didn't care about climate change. They didn't participate in the meetings we had. In the recent past, they did, because all of a sudden they experienced this increasing problem, with, not only with wildfires, but also with water scarcity. The melting of glaciers is a special problem. The Tibetan Plateau, provides more than one billion people in China, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan with fresh water. If these glaciers melt, you will have flooding in the near future and you will have droughts in the longer term perspective. Where are these people going to, to, to get fed? How? I don't know. I think it's a colossal problem. And even at two degrees of average warming, we are likely to lose the Tibetan plateau. So that's why I think that even two degrees is probably too much. Food production, we've already talked about. Africa is likely to suffer the most because most of the agriculture in Africa is rain fed. So there's no alternative. Uh, the challenges are huge. And I would submit, and like Stefan said, if we had started to act boldly in 1990 when the 92, when the convention was agreed upon, we would have had a chance to do things in, a, in, a, in an orderly manner, but we didn't. And the negotiations are um, very, very slow. Um, I've been at almost every so-called COP since 1995, and it's, it's just a painful process to watch. They have developed a sort of a liturgy and a terminology that outsiders don't understand. And although some of those diplomats, negotiators, work hard and are very sincere people, as a group, I find it almost pathetic. Um, and I recently met a senior American negotiator and said, you know, I follow this now for so many years, and some of these people they are likely to be happy if the negotiations just continue and drag out because they earn a living from this. Now. And they like this kind of, of process. So I think we have to throw a bomb into the whole system. 
and do something much more imaginative. And I don't think the negotiation process can solve this problem. I think political leadership at a higher level must be brought in. And we're still waiting for that. There was a meeting between our Prime Minister and Mr. Obama yesterday and the day before yesterday. I don't know exactly what came out of it. Um, but of course, the fact that the US Congress seems to be absorbed by the health crisis or health system crisis rather than the climate crisis is, of course, not positive news. On the other hand, how can you allow a political complication in one part of the world to prevent the world at large to reach an agreement on something where political compromises don't work? I mean, here we talk about physics, chemistry, biology. If, if water freezes at zero degrees, no political compromise in the world can change that. But we are, we are hearing more and more the language, oh, we have to do what is politically possible. Give me a break. You can, you can compromise about taxes, about trade tariffs, you can compromise about when you retire, etc., etc. But you cannot compromise on these issues. And we are talking about risks that are very, very, very difficult. The EU has provided leadership in the past. And if it weren't for the EU, the Climate Convention would be dead. So I'm, I'm very happy about that. And I think a lot has happened that is positive. But I would submit that the Energy Climate Package in 2008, that everybody is applauding, <coughs> was not very impressive. 2020, 2020 was the sort of catchword. 20% reduction to 2020. 20% renewables, 20% energy efficiency. With the readiness to move up to 30% if there is an international agreement. Um, what we need is much more than 40% in the industrialized countries. If you apply the logic shown in the last uh, slide by Stefan, that we have to peak in the very near past, you have to start to do very drastic reductions. Otherwise, you will have to almost eliminate emissions overnight if you pee <coughs> later on. And, but this discussion is not there, not in the negotiations. Um, and the support for developing countries so far, both when it comes to adaptation, because they are already suffering and will suffer, but also for technology. I mean, we built our standard of living, our comfort on cheap oil. Now we are asking the rest of the world to do something that is more expensive, at least up front. Um, well, then, of course, we have to pay most of the cost differential. And we have not demonstrated that willingness. And I'm afraid to say that the EU has been trying to reach an agreement for two years on how to move on that issue. That was a decision in Brussels last Friday. It's not very impressive. And if I were a developing country, I would say, more or less to hell with you. You created this problem, and you are not doing what you should. That doesn't mean that the developing countries don't have an enormous uh, task ahead of them, because they cannot continue to emit emissions like they do now. But we have to have a contract. We have to have a global contract between the North and the South for this to happen. And hopefully in the next five weeks, something is going to emerge that, that, will, that will make this possible. Um, finally, on this two degrees, what I lack is a real risk discussion. When we talk about aviation or nuclear energy, we measure and assess risks. Nobody would enter an airplane if they were told that there is a 5% likelihood that you, know, you, won't, you won't get down. You will crash. Here we are talking about, you know, we, let's refer to the two degrees, which everybody says, if we stay within two degrees of temperature increase, we are more or less safe. Let's agree that, let's, let's assume that's, that's correct. Well, what they don't tell you is that by halving emissions to 2050, there is not more than 50% chance to reach that two degrees. And yet, that seems to be the maximum what political leaders are willing to do. So we have no real risk discussion on this issue. Now, here are the key sectors to address. And for you in Hungary, I think some of them are very, very critical. Buildings more or less 40% of greenhouse gas emissions. Transport, 15 to 25%. Land use, both forests and food production. 
energy consuming and related products. I mean, all the computers, all the household appliances, all the mobile telephones, all require energy. When they are being produced, extracted resources produced, produced, and when they are being used. And then, of course, special areas, steel, cement, paper, and pulp, and aluminium. I would submit that in all these areas, however you cut the cake, there are enormous opportunities to do things in a different way. But it requires different business models and different incentive structures. And I would submit that in the next five to 10 years, regardless of the details in the Copenhagen Agreement, what you are likely to see is the following. We will move on further when it comes to renewables. We now have a binding agreement, 20% renewables in 2020 for the whole of European Union. It's a very good decision because it, it has really started to move things in that area. So that's good, very positive. I think that was an achievement. But we have to move further. 20% is not enough. So we will have 30 or 40% that is going to be discussed in the near future. Buildings, 40% of emissions. Passive housing is, of course, the next, the next objective. And you can already today build those houses. And they are being built. And in the near future, I think we will have houses that, in effect, deliver on net producers of energy by using solar cells on the roofs, etc. District heating and combined heat and power, very effective in Sweden. We have done away with a lot of emissions by moving into biomass and, and, and enlarging district heating and combined heat and power. In Hungary, in other uh, East and Central European countries, this could, be, this could happen and, and cut away a lot of emissions. And you could save money in, in the process. Transport, tougher fuel efficiency standards, but also new <coughs> transport systems. Food, new legislation on farming practices has to come. The food production and distribution system is something like 25 to 30 percent of all emissions or all cl climate impact. Meat. There was an outcry the other day when Lord, Lord Stern said we have to reduce meat consumption. Well, I can see many good reasons to reduce meat consumption. It's not only climate change. I mean, your health is one, one example. And when we say to people, maybe you should have a bit less meat because it's good for your health, nobody really uh, objects. <coughs> but now, when he said it, referring to climate change, oh, no, no, don't, don't interfere with our living standards. But I think it, 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 it is a given that we have we, land is going to be scarce in the future, water is going to be scarce in the future, meat production is a heavy toll on that. Eco-design directive, which regulates or tries to regulate efficiency standards for these kind of, of things, that has to be tougher in the future and is a very good driver towards efficiency. Emissions trading system has to also be tougher and we have to auction the permits to give them free away, I'm sorry. It's, it's a contradiction in terms. Um, finally, I, I always ask myself, what is the reason that we are moving so slow? Now, one is that climate skeptics are all over the place and writing these kinds of letters to the editors and you know, causing concern and confusion among many, many citizens. Because this is a complex problem. And, and, and when they hear all of a sudden that, oh, no, sea level is not going, going up, it's going down. Or uh, Arctic ice is, is, is not going down, it's going up. They, they get confused. So, so that's a problem. Uh, and here you see, which I think is quite scary, a recent poll in America. Two years ago, or three years ago, 77% of the Americans thought that climate change was indeed a very, very serious problem, and that humans were, were behind it. Now it's only 57, 57%. That will not make it easier for Congress. Another reason is, of course, that governments and businesses think it's too expensive to act. It's not. Vested interest spends a lot of money to try to slow down the process. And I ask myself, and I can see that some industries are in the bind here and face a problem. They have to rethink how they do things. But there are so many businesses who will not be affected by tougher standards, who are the winners, in fact. Why don't we hear more of them? Uh, well, I, I skipped this. Um, 